Grave digger. Digging a grave is hard work. Mentally and physically exhausting. Oh. You thought it was just mindless labor performed by simpletons? Well, <laughs> think again. You have to have balls of steel out here in the graveyard. Not everybody is capable of spending hours digging plots in the dead of the night. Why, don't be surprised if on a moonless evening with nothing but a rusty old lantern to illuminate this necropolis, you start hearing the voices whispering from the shadows. What will you do then? Run away crying with your tail tuckered between your legs? Not me. Not when there's work to be done. It's particularly difficult to bury a loved one. Many members of my family have made this the place of their eternal slumber. And who do you think is shoveling the dirt, huh? I'll give you a hint. It's not the Dalai Lama. That's what I'm doing here tonight. Putting another loved one to rest. My mother, to be precise. Uh, now, I told myself I wouldn't cry when I began digging this stinging thing, but I just can't help it. It's so hard knowing that after I pour this last shovel full of soil atop her plot that she'll forever be gone. Life's too cruel. I'll probably just wait around for a while after I'm done and reminisce about the good times, you know. At least until she runs out of oxygen. The Old House As a child, I always heard whispers about the old rundown house in the woods outside of town. Rumors of ghosts, ritual murders, cults, and mass suicides floated between the mouths of the chatty locals for as long as I could remember. Many believed the place to be abandoned but there are those who told tales of strange shadows that sometimes danced in the windows. Others swore they heard voices echoing out from behind the walls of a dilapidated structure when they passed by. The story I'm going to tell you is about my experience with that place. I never saw specters frolicking in the darkness or heard the ghastly wail of some menacing phantom, but the events that unfolded that sunny afternoon still scare me the same. It was warm that day. The sun broke through the treetops above our heads, scattering down to the forest floor, glimmering like golden confetti. I was twelve at the time. Peter was only nine, but even at that age, my little brother seemed to be on a constant mission to prove his bravery to me, as he felt it was the only way to validate himself in my eyes. We trudged through the last of the brush until we made our way into a clearing where the old house stood. We both heard stories about that place before, but this was the first time either of us had actually visited it. That direct old building was an intimidating sight. Moldy, rotten wood covered the face of the home like a diseased skin of a leper. Some of the windows had been smashed out while others were covered in a thick brown coat of dust. The house's entire frame crooked off to the left at an angle so sharp it seemed as if it was going to collapse at any moment. There it is, I told him. We stood at the edge of the clearing for what felt like an eternity, the two of us just staring at the time-damaged relic. You don't have to go in there, Peter. My youngest brother sent a frustrated scowl in my direction. I'm not afraid. I didn't say you were. Uh, look, I'm going in there, all the way to the basement, Peter said matter-of-factly. And when I do, you're going to tell the kids at school tomorrow how brave I am. He puffed out his chest and marched up the steps to the front door. I'll never forget that look on Peter's face when he turned back around and waved to me just before disappearing through the slanted doorway. He was so proud. I took a seat on the grass and leaned my back against a tree to wait for him. An hour passed, and there's still no sight of him. By the time the sun had started to set, 
Peter still hadn't returned. I could feel anxiety beginning to build up inside of me. What if... What if the rumors were right? What if a family of cannibals lived inside that place? And they are already preparing my brother for dinner. What if a monster was hiding in the basement? Waiting to tear Peter to shreds as soon as he set foot inside. I wanted to go check on him. But I was too afraid to go into the old house myself. So... I waited. My brother finally emerged from the broken down building just before the sun had set for the evening. Needless to say, I was relieved. I couldn't help but notice the curious expression on his face when he approached me. Almost as if he was sizing me up for the first time. What, what took so long, Peter? I asked him. I was worried that you got hurt. Sorry. I lost track of time. His voice was flat and expressionless. Its very tone made me scrunch my face in discomfort. I brushed it off and grabbed him around the arm. Ah, come on. We need to get home before it gets dark or Mom will ground us both. My mother gave us a stern lecture about staying out after dusk when we got back. The night went normally enough, but Peter's demeanor remained cold. And distant. I had been curious to ask him about the house, but I didn't want to do it in front of mother and father. We shared a room, so that evening when we were getting ready for bed, I decided to prod him. So, Peter, I said when I walked into the bedroom after I finished brushing my teeth, you were in that house for a while. I told you. I lost track of time. He responded. How? I asked. Peter sat up in bed. The blank expression on his face didn't change. But somehow, it felt even more removed than before. I was looking at stuff. I let out a nervous laugh. <laughs> well, did you see any monsters in there? I'm not sure how long it took for him to answer, but it felt like the silence lasted forever and a day. When he finally spoke again, his answer was short and to the point. He simply smiled at me and answered, Yes. And then blinked his eyes. I spent the evening in my parents' room after that. I was too afraid to sleep. In the morning, Peter was gone. My mom and dad called the police. By the end of the day, they had filed an official missing persons report. His face was on the milk cartons and billboards. There was a massive statewide manhunt for him. Investigators believed that he was abducted, so of course the press had a field day with it. The little boy who was taken from his bed in the dead of the night. The thing is, I don't believe Peter was abducted that evening by a prowler. I think whatever happened to him in that old house is what really led to his disappearance. It was my conversation with him before bed that cemented that idea in my mind. Specifically when I asked him if he'd seen any monsters. His reply had terrified me more than words could ever describe. It wasn't the grin he flashed before he answered. Though I found his smile disturbing. That's not what captured my attention. Nor was it his response confirming that he had indeed seen a monster while in the house. You see, the thing that truly frightened me, that sent me running to my mom and dad's room, was what happened when he blinked his eyes. It scared me, because when they closed his eyelids, his eyelids, they shut the wrong way. Freak show. The carnival ride's bright lights gleamed in the summer night like a sea of swirling, twirling, multicolored gemstones. Laughter filled the evening sky above the festive lot as adults and children alike took part in all the fair's amusing attractions. The smell of buttery popcorn danced in the air, purating with the sweet aromatic fragrances rising from the carts of cotton candy vendors. But amongst all the reverie and the merriment, no one seemed to notice a young girl holding a pink balloon and wandering through the crowd all by herself. It was Ellie's first time at the fair. The little girl was only seven years old and had tagged along with her older brother, 
and his group of friends. From the moment she arrived, she had found herself mesmerized by the maraud of enchanting sights and sounds. The place was unlike anything she had ever seen before, and she wanted to experience all of it. Ellie's teenage chaperones, on the other hand, were only interested in flirting with every pretty girl they happened to come across, so she snuck away when they weren't paying attention, hoping to take in as much of the carnival as possible. Finally free from her boring brother, Ellie explored the lot, her pink balloon trailing behind her while she bounced from one spectacle to another. She rode on the carousel. She watched a clown perform magic tricks. She even fed sugar cube to a pony at the petting zoo. To Ellie, the fair was the most magical place on the planet. After an hour or so, the little girl parked herself on a bench to rest her legs. She watched with a smile on her face as a group of thrill seekers staggered off a flashy spinning ride called the Cyclone. It wasn't until the last of them had stumbled away that a small tent caught her eye. The nondescript little tent was easy to miss, sandwiched between two massive whirling rides decorated with dazzling lights. Curiosity beckoned daily off the bench, taking her by the hand and leading her over to it. She stopped in front of the entrance and looked at the wooden sign hanging above her head. The words sent a shudder throughout the child's body. Freak show. Ellie had heard of a carnival freaks before, but never thought she'd get the opportunity to actually see one in person. Intrigue and fear waged a war inside the little girl's head as she contemplated whether or not to go inside. When the dust had settled, it was intrigue that had won out. Ellie pushed a flap of the entrance to the side and ducked into the tent, followed closely behind by her pink balloon. The inside of the tent was darker than she had expected. Off to the left, a tiny candle flickered on the table, providing the only source of light. It took a moment for Ellie's eyes to adjust, but once they did, she could feel the air escape her lungs as a sense of dread gushed through her veins. The little girl was standing at the most hideous boy she'd ever seen before in her life. He appeared to be suffering from some sort of terrible deformity that rendered his body a grotesque, tangled, bedridden mass of flesh and bones. His disfigured face, warped and misshapen, looked like a Picasso painting that the candlelight flickered off his malformed features. He opened his mouth to speak, but only a few raspy breaths escaped from his crooked lips. That means he likes you. Ellie spun around to see an old woman covered from head to toe in tattoos. The hundreds of piercings in her face jingled like a pocket full of change as she continued to talk. Oh, don't be alarmed. His name is the Human Powell, and he's a member of our little family. I know we're not as pretty as you are, but we're just people, and there's certainly nothing to be afraid of. I'm the tattoo lady. It's nice to meet you. F family? Ellie asked. Of course. There are more freaks here than just the human pile and myself. Come on out, everybody. The little girl wants to see you. Ellie swallowed the scream in her throat as more horribly disfigured people slinked out of the shadows and into the light. The old tattooed woman pointed to a man with gray, scaly skin. When he smiled at Ellie, she noticed that his teeth were as sharp as a carnivorous predator's. That's the African snake man, whispered the tattoo lady. He joined our family two years ago, traveled all the way from Liberia to be with us. Do you know where that is? Ellie shook her head. The old tatted up woman let out a chuckle. The piercings in her face clanked loudly as it mixed with her laughter, making it sound almost mechanical. Oh, oh, oh that's okay. Over there is the tumor woman. The tattooed freak pulled a pocket knife from her waistband and pointed the blade towards a woman in a sundress. Monstrous cysts were growing from her unsightly face. She waved a swollen hand covered in lumps and gross at Ellie, causing the little girl to wince. I, I think I want to go home now, mumbled Ellie. Nonsense. Tattoo lady jabbed her pocket knife above the little girl's head. A loud pop boomed throughout the tent. 
The ribbon attached to Ellie's balloon went limp in her hand. Her balloon was now nothing but a mangled piece of pink latex, lying in the dirt at her feet. Come now, said Tattoo Lady. There are more members of our family you must meet. Over there is the Lobster Boy. A sneering teenage boy around the same age as her brother waved a pair of claw-like hands in the air. The little girl could feel her heart beginning to race. And there, the old tattooed woman put her arm around Ellie and pointed her knife at a man whose body was completely covered in fur. They call him the Mongrel. A wicked smile crept its way across the old woman's pierced lips as she spoke again. Now, there's one more member of the family. Her name is the Little No-Face Girl. Ellie shifted her eyes around the tent, but couldn't figure out whom the tattooed lady was referring to. But, but there's nobody else here, stuttered Ellie. Where is she? The old tattooed woman placed the edge of her blade on top of Ellie's hairline. A trickle of blood ran down her brow. Don't worry, child. The little no-face girl will be here really, really soon. The stranger's dead. The knock at the door startled Marie. It was too late to be expecting visitors. She had just put her son to bed, her husband, Eric was hunched over at the sitting area in the foyer with a glass of 30-year-old scotch in one hand and his head in the other. He had seemed uncharacteristically distraught as the late. Marie loved her husband, but she realized she hadn't been very attentive lately. Between running her charity, attending social functions, and playing on the country club's tennis team, she hadn't got the opportunity to ask Eric what had been troubling him. She knew his company's stock had recently dropped a couple points, so she just assumed it was a money issue. To her, a little bit of cash was nothing to fret over. After all, they had come from practically nothing, and now they had plenty of it. They would be fine. Marie tugged open the heavy oak door to reveal a ominous-looking stranger standing behind it. He was so tall that... He had to duck his massive head under the oversized door's ten-foot-tall frame as he entered the room. His skin was pale, almost snow-white, a stark contrast to his intense, shadowy eyes. Two dark pieces of coal buried deep into the sunken sockets of his face. The stranger wore a long black trench coat buttoned down from his neck all the way just below his knees. His hands and his feet were massive nearly twice the size of a normal man's. When he smiled at Marie, she caught the glyphs of his teeth, jagged and pointed. They looked like they belonged in the mouth of a mangy dog. The stranger turned his colossal head towards Marie's husband and began to speak. His voice was so low and gravelly, but so powerful. She felt it rumble through the room's walls and her body alike. Eric Wallace. I have come to collect my debt. It was in that moment that Marie understood what was going on. The success of Eric's internet startup, the big house in the hills, the fancy cars, the charity, and most importantly, the horrible, giant, inhuman looking man who had just entered their home. Eric had made a deal with the devil. She flung herself to the demon's feet. Please, you can't take his soul, she cried. There has to be another way. The stranger reached out a long, bony finger and caressed her wet, tear-soaked cheeks. Oh, my dear. I'm afraid you misunderstand. Your husband... <laughs> your husband didn't sell me his soul. He sold me yours.